first be seen. Uh, when we read in the scriptures this day, and it was a long reading, thanks Joe, good job. Uh, it, but it's a thirsty scene, and you can imagine the scene, it's a hot day, it's out in the desert, there's no living water around, there's no streams of water, there's no sign of rain, it is dry, and you are thirsty. And maybe it's uh, sort of your Lenten journey. Maybe some of you have already begun to develop this thirst for God in your lives. And here is where Jesus, it's the noon of the day, and he comes upon this woman, and she's at the well, and she's got a bucket, and she's going down to get her uh, daily uh, trip to get water for her household. And Jesus encounters her, and he begins to have this conversation with her. So you can imagine it is just a hot day. You can imagine that time of thirst. Imagine, if you will, a Saturday afternoon uh, in Coloma, and you know it's Maybe it's hot and we're going to try to escape the heat uh, in the movie theater downtown here, the Loma of Coloma. <laughs> and, you know, imagine, if you will, uh, you've got your father of two small children and you've spent all your cash on uh, sodas for them and popcorn and whatnot, even though it's a good deal, and spend everything you have. And uh, you realize that you're thirsty. <laughs> And you, you don't drink soda, so you got to go get a glass of water. And you think, gee, uh, they'll give me a glass for water, right? It doesn't cost anything. I'll just go in there and ask for a glass of water. Don't need any fancy bottle, just a glass of water. So I go to the counter and ask for a glass of water, and it'll be a dollar, Pastor. <laughs> oh, be a dollar. Well, I think I might be able to scrounge a dollar around there, and I'm searching my pockets. And then, all of a sudden, this saint shows up out of nowhere. He's been buying his kids, uh, you know, nachos and nuts and whatnot. And he says, well, put the pastor's uh, water on my charge. And all of a sudden, a person who didn't have any bucket or any cup, if you will, styrofoam cup, is given a styrofoam cup. And it's filled with water. And I said to myself, boy, i got to share this story. I mean, I don't know who, I, I thanked the fellow, and he sort of, you're welcome, went away, and I didn't even get his name, but i got to share this story. Because here it was, my woman at the well story. And Jesus says to the woman at the well, he says, hey, uh, can I have a drink? It's real hot out here. And uh, she says, well, well, she says this. Let's have that first fill in the blank. No. Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? And she replies to him. You know, he says, if you knew who was asking you for a drink, you'd ask me for a drink. Where do you get the living water that you, just, that you say? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us as well, and with his sons and his flocks, drank from it? This is a very complicated text that we read from uh, John. There's a lot of backstory involved in it. This story of Jacob's well. And if you want to read the story of Jacob's well, um, you're not going to find it in the scriptures, but what you will find is the story of Jacob coming back from his journey afar, the time that he met Rachel and Leah, and coming back into his homeland. God called Jacob to come back. And right before he gets back, he stops in this place uh, near Sychar. At Jesus' time. And he buys a plot of land. And the biblical scholars say that's the story. That's all you're going to get of the story of the well. In that plot of land is where uh, Jacob's well is and where he gave the plot of land that he purchased before he went back to make up with his brother Esau, before he went back to his homeland from his journeys afar, before God called him back, before God, right before God, or right as God, is changing Jacob's name. Does anybody know what uh, Jacob's name is? This is bonus points here for today. Jacob had his name changed by God just like Abraham, Abram did. Uh, and you can recall, Jean's searching her memory banks right now. It's near there. Got it? Nope. Okay, Israel. Israel, which means one who struggles with God. Israel. And so the story goes, on, this, on the mountain, or near the plot of land that he purchased for the well, God wrestled with Jacob. The, the time that he was trying to think, oh, you know, he sent his family, and he was, he was coming back to his homeland, and was about ready to enter into the, the, the 
promised land again, if you will. He was about ready to enter back into this promised land, but there was Esau, and he had stolen Esau's rightful inheritance. And he was thinking, how am I going to get back with my brother? He's going to kill me when he sees me. And so, you know, uh, maybe you never had this problem before. How do I get back in touch with this person I haven't called for a long time? And you hem and haw over it, and it keeps you up at night. Well, that's where Jacob was before he was going back home. And so he was staying up overnight, and he's struggling. And God came to him in the form of what he thought was just a visiting stranger or a passerby. And he started wrestling. They started this wrestling match. And, you know, Jacob wrestled with this angel of God all night long and then finally survived uh, finally survived the wrestling match and he said you got to tell me your name you got to give me a blessing because I got a big deal I mean I've wrestled you all night long now I got to go wrestle with my brother Esau he's a big hairy guy and he will take me down and, and the angel said well I tell you what I can't really tell you my name so he touched his hip and broke his hip right there on the spot and it all went down and said yeah you, you I really have control of this whole thing, by the way. And he says, you know, you're no longer Jacob. You are Israel. Because you have wrestled with God. You have struggled with God all night and survived. If you can struggle with God all night and survive, don't even worry about what you got between your brother. You know, that, that'll, be over, that'll be overcome. And so that was the... The beginning of the story, but I put Mark it down in your film books. If you want to read more of the story of, and about that plot of land and about what happens next, you, I encourage you to do so. It'll be in the challenges. But this is where, this is the plot of land on which uh, this encounter is happening with this brassy lady uh, and Jesus. Love those stories, you know, of the brassy women with Jesus and how they question. You know, hey, uh, well, I only came for the lost children of Israel, right? And it's not right for me to give bread to the dogs. Remember that Canaanite woman? And she says, hey, leave the dogs eat the bread that fall from the master's table, Jesus. You know, and it, it is so great to see how he responds to these brassy women. Appropriate that we have one reading the text today. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, she questions him back. You know, you're talking about you want a drink of water. You're talking about now. You're saying you have this kind of water that will is a living water, and you are this living water. And if I ask, I should ask you for a drink. But you know, you have no bucket, and this well is deep. What is the deal? And Jesus is trying to capture her imagination a little bit. Let's have that next fill in the blank. And Jesus is telling her this. Those who drink from the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. He's saying it's a difference between, you know, a dead, wa dead water, you know, water that is at the bottom of the well that's not going to refill. You know, basically, um, does anybody have a well here? Okay. Have you ever had to re-drill the well? Yeah, okay. Uh, and so, you know, at, at a point, you, the, the water from the well sort of, it's finite, right? It, the water from the well starts to run out, and then you have to dig it deeper to get more water. And then, uh, you know, eventually, uh, you have to dig in a whole new location. That's really expensive. Oh, we don't have to deal with that. But uh, to get more water. That's what I call dead water, okay? That's water that is in the ground, and you're, gonna, you're just, it's finite. You're just pulling it out, and when it's gone, it's gone. But the living water is the water that we see uh, that comes from the sky on, on the mountains and runs towards the ocean. That's living water, and it's constantly replenishing itself. And Jesus is saying, that's the kind of water that we're talking about. Not dead water that you're going to run out of, but water that's constantly being replenished from the heavens. And he's saying, I know we're in a desert, but I'm talk that's the living water that I'm trying to get capture your imagination around. And that's what we're talking about. Now, the other kind of living water is that water that comes from the sky that gets seeped into the ground and then it becomes like a spring, right? And the spring water that comes out of the ground. And he's saying, and he's even, imagine this, a spring of water, a spring of water, not a dead well, but a spring of water that is gushing up, just like old faithful, you know, every uh, 12 minutes or 14 minutes, actually even that one's starting to run out, but it springs up, shoots up high. And that is what we're talking about. Gushing up to eternal life. 
So she says, you know, hey, what are you talking about? Give me some of this water. And I know that you're getting into metaphor here, too, obviously. But, you know, what are you talking about? Give me some of this water. Now, I know that other preachers, and you might maybe even have heard this before, this woman is there at the middle of the day. Does that seem like a good time to go get water in the, in the desert at the high noon? <laughs> No. And so probably you heard the story that, you know, this woman was somewhat of an outcast. So all the other women in the community are going to have a regular water run that probably happens in the, in the cool of the morning or then in the cool of the evening, but not at high noon. She's going by herself because she's somewhat of an outcast. And maybe Jesus picked up on that because, you know, he's kind of, if you want to find Jesus, just look among the outcasts, actually. He's always... He's connected to them in some powerful way, gravitates to them in some powerful way. And so at least he's going, he's having this conversation with her, and he says, you're kind of brassy, and I like that in my, in my, in my people who I talk to and the people who follow me. But I tell you what, you know, uh, I know that people think of you in a particular way, and you're probably being pigeonholed or boxed up in this particular way. But I want you to know, even though you've never met me before, I know everything there is to know about you. And he begins to tell her that. You know, no, you're not married to anybody. In fact... You've had five husbands, and the one that you're with now isn't even a husband. And she's going, oh boy, how does this person know this? He must be a prophet. But he's saying, you know what? All that doesn't matter. Because I'm inviting you into a whole new identity. I'm inviting you into a whole new identity. I know that you are identified with these people, these descendants of uh, Jacob, who are on the outcast. They're not even part of the Israel covenant. They're sort of on the outcast, on the outside. But I'm inviting you into a whole new identity. You're going to be a Messiah follower now. You've been waiting, and I'm here. And you're going to get a whole new identity in that Messiah. And I don't care what anybody says about you, you are meeting, and you're drinking, you're having a drink with the one who's going to change your life. And he does so, and as soon as she enters into the stream, she begins to enter into a stream of living water. Just like that angel who came to me at the Coloma, a Loma of Coloma, just like that angel who came to me, she enters into the stream of living water. I don't know what happened to that angel. I don't know what happened to that person. I don't know what kind of moments that he was moved to offer me a simple buck so that I could get a bucket so that I might have a drink. Right? But something was working in his life. And it changed him. And then he decided to be a part of that change. And then he's able to draw from a kind of energy that isn't limited, but an energy that is limitless. Because he becomes a part of a chain of Jesus followers, a part of a chain of Messiah followers. Jesus said this himself. He said, you know, you're going to be able to do all the things that I do, that you see me do. You know, put mud on people's eyes and help them see again. And you're going to be able to do all these things that I do, you know, provide food. Uh, for people who are hungry. You're going to be able to do all these things that I do, and even more. But why even more? Because there's only one of him. In the body of Christ today, there are thousands. The body of Christ today, there are thousands, not just of people, but thousands of years. We haven't just been here for 150 years, or 200 years next door. Uh, but we... But the people, the body of Christ, have been here for more than 2,000 years. And that's what it's all about. And then when you become, when you accept that new identity in Christ Jesus, you become part of this living water that flows people by people, year by year, way more than you could have possibly imagined. When the disciples come back and they see Jesus in this situation, they're thinking, uh-oh, he's talking to a woman, that's bad. Uh-oh, he's talking to a woman from Sakaar. That's really bad. She goes off. She left her bucket now. She's a whole new person. She doesn't even, you know, she's supposed to get water. We've all had those moments when we walk into a room and we can't remember what we're supposed to be doing. But that's not really exactly what's happening here. Uh, she left her bucket. She was so moved by whatever it was that Jesus said. She was so moved and caught up in this living water that she just gave up on the dead water. She came back and she started to share her story of encounter with Jesus with others. And so the disciples come in and they say, hey, you know, that woman, you shouldn't have been with her. They didn't say that. And, and they said, they didn't even ask her, why was she talking to Jesus? But they're thinking it. But then they say, what they do say is, hey, you're hungry. You have need to eat. What does Jesus say? 
All right, food you know nothing about. Are we into that next one? Yeah, no. Let's have that next one. I have food you know nothing about. That food that you know nothing about is the food that I complete the work of my father. I eat, I feast off the work of my father. And when I engage in that work, I'm energized. I've been in some long meetings this week with you, uh, the, uh, with uh, Daryl and uh, with uh, uh, with Diane, and we had like these marathon meetings, two hours each. And you know, Daryl, I was really worried, but he kept, he left that meeting and he said, you know, when we get done with these meetings, I always feel so energized, so energized, and I do too. Because what were we doing? We're engaged in the will of our Father, and we're so passionate about it, even though we've gone over things, over things, or, you know, talking about what kind of pitfalls we might be facing. We are energized because we are part of the living water. Even though we've gone without food. We're eating food that we don't know anything about. God has been at work in these communities long before we arrived, and will be at work long before, long after we go. Jesus says this to the disciples, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. The fellow who offered me the bucket that I took my cup in, my cup of water in, the fellow who offered that, I don't know what God was working on in that. And, I, you know, he doesn't know, like, what he was entering into with me. He, he, maybe he didn't even realize I was a preacher, and then I'd be so moved by this gift. But those little mini acts are part of a chain of events of living water that you can draw energy from that is limitless. Now that's just a real example of how God is making this metaphorical gushing up spring of water in the world. That's just a one, you know, one sign. It can take flesh in all sorts of ways in your lives. And the truth is, we can't hardly get our minds around eternity, because that's really what we're talking about. Your challenge this week, if you choose to accept it, share a drink with a friend. And maybe this is a new friend that you don't even know yet. Contemplate your driver's license. Take out your picture, have a look at it. Does it look anything like you? <laughs> uh, but as you do, think about it. I mean, this is the piece that people are saying, who are you? You know, when you have to demonstrate who you are, you pull that license out. But contemplate your driver's license and think about the new identity that God is inviting you to be a part of as you contemplate that driver's license. The other piece that you might like to do is read Genesis 32 through 35, the whole chapter, uh, more Bible reading. Read Genesis 32 through 35, and what you're going to encounter there is a new identity for Jacob. And note, uh, here's where the scholars say it's Jacob's wealth thing comes into play.